You are about to have your deposition taken. You'll be asked a number of questions under oath by an attorney. Detailed questions about yourself and the case you are involved with. These questions and your answers will be recorded and transcribed by a court reporter. The result will be a written document containing word for word all the questions asked with the answers that you gave. A document that ultimately may be entered as evidence in a court of law. This program will help guide you through this somewhat intimidating legal process. We will explain why a deposition is taken and show you how to avoid mistakes that witnesses commonly make. Your goal should be to give the best testimony you can, which may ultimately lead to a just resolution of the lawsuit. As you watch, you may have additional questions about this process, what to expect or what to say. Jot these questions down so that you can discuss them later with your attorney after you've watched this program. What is the purpose of a deposition and why is it so important? Well, primary reason to conduct a deposition is what lawyers call discovery. Discovery is the legal term for the process of gathering all the facts and information that may pertain to a case. It is an attorney's professional responsibility to learn as much as he or she can about any matters handled for clients. A deposition is one of the many procedures used for this purpose. But there are more subtle reasons for taking depositions. In addition to probing for leads and information that can help or harm their case, a questioning attorney uses a deposition to size you up and evaluate you as a witness to determine your credibility or believability and see how well you will present yourself in front of a judge or jury should you eventually be called in to testify in court. Furthermore, during this fact-finding, the lawyer is asking you to commit under oath in the hopes that your answer may contain incorrect or inconsistent statements that can be used later at trial. Finally, it is important to understand that the deposition may well be the only time you testify in the case because most lawsuits never go to trial. Despite the presentations of TV and the movies, more than 90% of all cases settle out of court. So what you say and how you say it in your deposition are very important and may have an impact on the outcome of the case. If this all sounds a little intimidating, it needn't be. If you just follow the simple guidelines in this video and the instructions of your attorney, you'll do great. What is your responsibility during the deposition? Your primary responsibility at the deposition is to listen carefully to each question, to make sure you understand the question, and then to answer the question truthfully and accurately. Does this mean you have to know the answer to every single question? Not at all. Will you have to know and remember every fact about the case? Hardly. Should you always tell the truth? Absolutely. Where does a deposition take place and who will be there? Depositions usually take place in a conference room at a law office, hotel, or some other neutral site. At the deposition, there will be at least three other people present. First, your own attorney who's there to make sure that your rights are protected and that you understand everything that takes place. Second, the opposing attorney. This attorney will ask questions in an effort to learn as much as he or she can about the case for the benefit of his or her client. Third, a court reporter. This individual will take down everything that is said on the record. In addition, if one of the attorneys requested that your deposition be video recorded, a videographer will be present to operate the video equipment. It is also possible that support staff members for one or both attorneys will also be present. You raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. With the taking of the oath, the deposition begins. You are now on the record, and anything said will be taken down by the court reporter. However, 
the court reporter cannot record the nodding of a head, gestures, and other nonverbal communications. So you must always answer each question verbally. Also, instead of saying, uh-huh, say yes. And no, instead of, uh-uh. Mrs. Douglas, my name is John Brennan, and I'm representing Mr. Howard in this case. If at any time during this deposition I ask a question that you don't understand, please let me know and I'll try to rephrase it. If you answer a question, I'll assume you understand it. Now, would you please state your complete name for the record? Susan Douglas. Susan Mary Douglas. Are you married, Mrs. Douglas? Uh, yes. Bob and I have been together for 15 years. Okay, 14. It'll be 15 next month. And do you have children? Yes, I have three. And what are their ages? Um, Bobby's 10, uh, and I have two daughters. Uh, Tracy is two, uh, and Lynn is seven. Um, eight and not yet, no, one, okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, one is seven and the other is almost two. Do your best to stay calm. Take your time when answering the question so you don't quickly give information that you are unsure about and have to correct yourself. Remember that the result of your testimony is a written document. Pauses will not show up on the transcript. Susan Douglas's case involves a car accident at an intersection. She is suing defendant Reed Howard to compensate for injuries she received when Howard ran a stop sign and collided with a car that crashed into the car she was driving. Even though Mr. Howard was the major cause of the accident, his attorney would like to show that Mrs. Douglas was partially responsible for the accident by either driving too fast or failing to stop once Howard entered the intersection. While the facts of your case will be different, the techniques you will see demonstrated will be useful in giving effective testimony. Now, let's look at some guidelines for your deposition. Never volunteer information. In this example, Mrs. Douglas gives the opposing attorney an advantage by volunteering information that goes beyond the scope of the question. How long were you driving along Capitol Avenue before the accident? Uh, probably about uh, six blocks um, because I turned left on Capitol from 3rd. Yeah, that's right, because the doctor's office is on Capitol and 3rd. Oh, you were at the doctor's office that morning? Yes, that's where we were coming from. When you say we, who are we talking about? Uh, my two-year-old daughter, Tracy, uh, and my son. And why were you at the doctor's? I had been up all night uh, because uh, my two-year-old daughter had uh, strep throat. Um, uh, that's what the doctor thought. In her answers, Mrs. Douglas has gone beyond the scope of the question, a common error. She has volunteered unrequested information and has given the opposing attorney new leads of inquiry, which could damage her case. For example, was she distracted by her sick two-year-old? Or was she inattentive because of a lack of sleep? That is all it may take for a judge or jury to form an opinion or to draw their own conclusion about the cause of the accident, which could weaken her case. Many of us want to be helpful or want to tell our side of the story, but in a deposition, it is unwise to volunteer information of any kind. Here are a couple of easy tips to avoid this common mistake. First, remember to listen carefully to each question asked. Then, limit your answer to that question. When you have provided the information asked for, stop and wait for the next question to be asked. Don't let nonverbal cues such as raised eyebrows, silence, or a tilt of a pet from the opposing attorney coax you into talking more. One technique to stay focused on the question is to use part of the question in your answer. Let's see how Mrs. Douglas might have answered differently. How long had you been driving on Capitol Avenue before the accident? Let's see, for probably about as long as it takes to go six blocks. Um, I was driving on Capitol for about 45 seconds. Here, Mrs. Douglas thought about her response before she answered. Her answer was brief and to the point. Be certain you understand the question. Another simple rule to keep in mind is to be certain you understand the question. 
a witness should never try to answer a question unless its meaning is absolutely clear. Questions are sometimes ambiguously vague because language is not very precise and words have different meanings to different people. Also, lawyers have a reputation for using phrases not typically used by others. Let's see an example. While you were driving on a preferential road, Mrs. Douglas, you did not happen to notice whether Mr. Howard was going to stop or not, did you? Yes. I, I mean, no? No. Obviously, Mrs. Douglas does not know the legal meaning of preferential. Let's look at that question. While you were driving on a preferential road, Mrs. Douglas, you did not happen to notice whether Mr. Howard was going to stop or not, did you? No matter how she answers this, yes or no, it'll be unclear whether she is saying she was looking out or not, or whether she saw that Howard would or would not stop. Don't be afraid to ask what a word or question means. And if you don't understand a question, ask for it to be repeated, clarified, or put into plain language. What do you mean by preferential road? Major thoroughfare. Well, um, could you repeat the question? I, I don't think I have it clearly. I agree, Counselor. The question is ambiguous. Another problem area is guessing at the facts. Don't guess. When a deponent begins to guess or tries to answer, when they are really unsure, they are asking for trouble. Just because a question is asked doesn't mean you have to know the answer. This is especially true when discussing detailed issues of time interval, distances, and speed, such as in this example. Mrs. Douglas, how far were you into the intersection before you noticed the Howard vehicle? I was maybe 20 yards away. How fast were you going? I was going the speed limit, 35 miles per hour. How much time had elapsed from the time you saw the Howard vehicle to the time of impact? Oh, well, let me see it. That's hard to say. I... Well, was it a minute? Surely you can tell me that. No, no, it was less than that. Was it between 30 seconds and a minute? No, it was less than that, I think. Well, was it 10 seconds? Uh, I suppose so. I mean, I guess that sounds right. Mrs. Douglas seems sure of her distance and speed, but in reality, did not know how long it took her to get to the intersection after seeing Howard's truck. Her mistake was in letting the lawyer suggest an answer by putting words in her mouth and forcing her to guess about the time. This has put her testimony about distance and speed in doubt because the numbers are not consistent. For example, if she was going 35 miles an hour and she really did have 10 seconds to react to Howard's vehicle, she would have had plenty of time to stop. So, the judge or jury might conclude that she was not paying attention. Be sure to review the facts of the case with your attorney so that there is no confusion about what happened. And remember, if you don't know the answer to a question or you don't recall a fact, it is perfectly appropriate to say, I don't know or I don't recall. How much time elapsed between the time you first saw the Howard vehicle and the impact? I'm not sure. Well, was it a minute? Surely you could tell me that. No, I don't know. Was it between 30 seconds and a minute? All I can tell you is that I don't know. In this last example, not only did Mrs. Douglas not guess at an answer, she did not let the attorney suggest an answer. There are some other times when witnesses are tempted to guess at answers. One is when a question or reference is made to information contained in written documents. If this happens, you should request a copy of the document in question to refresh your memory. Mrs. Douglas, isn't it true that in the statement you gave the police at the time of the accident that is in the police report, you stated you were fine? Could I see a copy of the report? Actually, in the report following the statement that you referred to, it says that I was concerned about the condition of my children. That was my primary concern, and that's the only reason that I didn't ask for medical assistance. Here, 
Mrs. Douglas was able to refresh her memory by requesting a copy of the police report, which showed that her statement was taken slightly out of context. Also, watch out that you do not guess about photos, illustrations, or drawings if you are asked to do so. Don't be evasive. Earlier in the program, we advised you not to volunteer information. But on the other hand, do not try to lie or hide information. If you are evasive, it might also hurt your case. Mrs. Douglas has testified that she continues to suffer from neck pain following the accident. Mrs. Douglas, since the time of the accident, have you gone on any vacations with your family? Uh, we might have. Mrs. Douglas, do you or do you not remember going on a vacation last year with your family? Um, I, I, uh, I, I think I might have. Well, the medical report from your own doctor says that you went downhill skiing. Where did you go? Vail, Colorado. For downhill skiing? Yes, my whole family went. And did you ski with your family? Um, I, I might have. <clears throat> Mrs. Douglas, do you recall skiing with your family or not? Um, uh, I, I might have skied a little. Did you ski every day? I'm not sure. Is it probable that you skied every day while you were there? Yeah, I guess so. Of course, Mrs. Douglas remembers if and when she skied. But she's afraid her complaint of neck pain will not be believed. She will have more credibility in the long run, however, if she is more forthcoming about her activities. Mrs. Douglas, since the time of the accident, have you gone on any vacations with your family? Yes. Where did you go? Vail, Colorado. For downhill skiing? Yes. How many days? For about a week. Did you ski, Mrs. Douglas? Yeah, I, I sure tried. In this last situation, Mrs. Douglas was quite forthright when answering these questions. By doing so, she allows her attorney to later argue that even while trying to participate in her family's favorite activity, skiing, she still experienced a lot of pain. So remember, don't offer more information than the question requires. But on the other hand, don't be evasive. A skillful attorney will generally get the information he or she wants and may discredit you in the process. Don't get angry, cute, or sarcastic. When testifying, resist the urge to get angry, cute, or sarcastic. A witness in Mrs. Douglas's position could easily become angry about being asked so many questions about her own driving when she feels that Mr. Howard is to blame. The danger is that the deponent will begin to advocate or promote his or her case by arguing. Did you happen to have the radio on that day, Mrs. Douglas? I might have. You remember listening to any music? It's possible. Do you turn your music up fairly loud? Well, sometimes. After the time you saw the Howard truck and before the time of impact, did you turn your steering wheel to the left or the right? How can you ask me something like that? I mean, why don't you ask him why he didn't stop? I mean, there wasn't enough time to do anything. Did you even apply the brakes before impact? Well, how could I? It was so fast. Listen, I had the right of way, and he ran the stop sign and hit me. Okay? I, I never speed. I, I always yield to others. I always look where I'm going. And, well, what do you expect me to say? You expect me to say that I wasn't paying attention and I ran into him? Mrs. Douglas's anger and advocacy may do her case more harm than good. Using phrases like, I never speed, and I always look might make her testimony a little less believable. Stay cool, even when you feel you've already answered a question, or if the question is inappropriate. If questions are repetitive or inappropriate, your attorney will step in with an objection. How can a deposition be used at trial? To demonstrate the importance of being clear about the facts during a deposition, here is an example of how the deposition can be used at trial. After her attorney has finished asking questions, 
Mr. Howard's attorney will have an opportunity to cross-examine Mrs. Douglas. No more questions. Do you have cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Mrs. Douglas, your testimony a minute ago was that you were going about 25 miles per hour as you approached the intersection. Is that correct? Yes. Mrs. Douglas, do you remember about a year ago coming into my office with your attorney and giving a deposition in this case? Yes, I do. I recall that. Your Honor, may I approach the witness with a copy of that deposition? Yes, you may. Mrs. Douglas, at that time, I asked you some questions which you answered under oath. Is that correct? Yes. Would you look at page 17 of your deposition? I'd like you to read lines 5 through 10 silently as I read them aloud. And then I'll ask you if you gave those answers to the questions. Question. Now, Mrs. Douglas, how far were you from the intersection when you first noticed the Howard truck? Answer. I was maybe 20 yards away. Question. How fast were you going at that time? Answer. I was going about 35 miles per hour. Mrs. Douglas, did you give those answers to those questions? Yes, I did. But you see, I really That'll didn't. That'll be all, Mrs. Douglas. On the witness stand, Mrs. Douglas's testimony regarding her speed differs from her deposition, perhaps casting some doubt on her story. Do you see how important it is to be clear and consistent about every fact you testify to during your deposition? So far, we have discussed guidelines concerning volunteering information, understanding questions, guessing at facts, being evasive, staying in control, and being consistent with your facts. Now, let's consider another case to see how the guidelines we've discussed might apply to a different fact situation. A contractor, Mr. James Kamas, is suing a Mrs. Bernice Hill for money that he claims she owes him for remodeling her house. Mrs. Hill admits that Mr. Kamas remodeled her house, but argues that he used the wrong color when painting the house. Mrs. Hill's attorney is deposing the contractor. Mr. Kamas is unhappy at having to spend his entire morning answering questions. Perhaps he figures he'll get done faster and get back to work if he tells the opposing attorney everything he thinks she needs to know. See if you can identify the problems that Mr. Kamas is creating for himself. Mr. Kamas, did you and Mrs. Hill decide on a color for the house? She told me she wanted a light gray. Uh, so I mixed up some samples, I put some colors in some pieces of wood, and I showed them to her. Uh, she chose the color she wanted. In fact, I have the sample out in the back of the truck. Good. I, I will come back to that. Now, at what point did Mrs. Hill express dissatisfaction to you about the color you were painting her house? Well, I was already a week into the job when Mrs. Hill got back from some weekend trip. Uh, I was just about through when she tells me the color is too dark. I, I was shocked. I mean, she had spoken to my wife just a few days earlier when she was trying to get a hold of me, and she didn't say anything to her about it. In answering both questions, Mr. Kamas volunteered information that went beyond the scope of the questions. By telling the opposing attorney more than she asked for, it may have weakened his claim. Using the same fact situation, let's look at another guideline to keep in mind. Always stay alert and pay attention to objections. If your attorney makes an objection, it does not mean that it's time out for you. On the contrary, it is time to pay close attention to the objection made by your attorney. Mr. Thomas, when did you substantially finish the project? Well, I'd say I object. The question is vague and confusing. I can answer it. Now wait. Jim, I, I want an objection on the record. All right, counsel. What exactly about the question do you find vague and confusing? Well, the term substantially could be misleading. Do you mean done completely or done with painting and cleanup? Or, or what about Mr. Thomas's subcontractor? 
All right, I'll rephrase the question. Mr. Connors, when did you or your employees finish applying paint to Mrs. Hill's house? Well, um, we finished the painting part of the job on April 18th. By listening closely to the question, making sure the question was fully asked, and carefully considering your answer, you will allow your lawyer enough time to enter an objection on the record. Mr. Kamas learned by listening to his attorney that it was important to distinguish painting from the cleanup in his testimony. 